I'm Thomas Hall, Executive Director of Clean Start. Welcome to Clean Start Perspectives with Nick Papas of MP Energy. Great. Thanks so much, Thomas. And thanks to both you and Gary for inviting me here. I'm really excited to join you all and get to know the, the Clean Start community a little bit and talk about one of my favorite topics. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up my slides. All right. Well, great. Well, let me let me jump right in. So um, I'm going to talk about grid decarbonization today. It's a huge topic, obviously. Uh, a lot of the work I do is really in the weeds and sort of the bowels of regulatory proceedings. I've really tried uh, to avoid boring anyone or putting anyone to sleep at 9 a.m. I've tried to bring things to a higher level and hopefully make this uh, relevant for, for this community at a, at a level that's useful. So bringing out some really big themes about where we're at as we make our transition, as well as some of the things we need to do as we go forward and, uh, and some of the uh, policy considerations as we move forward. So uh, I'm gonna probably skip a couple slides just to keep the timing quick uh, within 10 minutes and save a lot of time for Q&A. So the slides will be available afterwards if folks wanna kind of dig in more on the content. So a little bit about me, um, I've been working in energy and climate for pretty much my entire career, uh, starting with uh, work with the state legislature and then moving more and more into utility regulation, first with SoCal Edison and later with, with Cal CCA uh, and recently became an independent consultant. So I work day-to-day um, -day really focused on regulatory issues, how we think about sort of reliable decarbonization and all the place, all the, the stakeholders and policies we need to align to, to get us there. Uh, but bigger picture, my mission is really to help ensure California's climate policy is ready for other parts of the world to adopt and follow suit. You know, really everything we do here is about building a blueprint for others to follow, because that's really the only way we can achieve our, our mission on a global scale. Um, so a little bit about the presentation today, um, I've kind of broken it up into three parts. First, I want to give a quick status report a couple decades into our decarbonization transition, talk about some of the challenges and themes, and then think about, you know, as the next 10, 20, 30 years, what are some of the sort of long view issues we need to be thinking about, whether you're, you know, in industry developing new technologies, a policymaker developing new policies, sort of thinking about where we go from here and how we get the right balance. Uh, so one thing that I think is, is really helpful for us, you know, as humans, we love stories. And, and one story that I think is really useful to conceptualize where we're at in our energy transition is we're kind of moving into a second phase. So the first 20 years or so, we were really focused on just the feasibility. Can we build renewables? Can we get them connected to the grid? How can we make that a sort of really uh, substantial and meaningful part of our um, clean energy transition. And, and I'll say 10, 10 years ago, there were many folks who doubted the feasibility of just getting renewables onto the system. And I think it's fair to say that we've, we've proved a lot of the doubters wrong. We have made great strides in building, particularly solar and wind in California, both at the utility scale and uh, you know, at, at uh, homes and businesses for solar. And we've really solved a lot of the technical challenges related to developing that industry, bringing costs down, getting projects interconnected. Um, but one area we didn't focus a lot over the last 10 years is sort of the long-term planning and integration as we think about reliability and how that intersects with decarbonization. And that's really where we're at today. So starting with the events of uh, the summer of 2020, when we had our first bulk power system outages, we've really been in a sprint to try to redesign the state's policies to focus on reliability. So thinking about serving energy after the sun sets um, and what happens when we lose some of our conventional power plants. Uh, and I think this is a really exciting time. It's going to really pivot our focus. Um, it's it's no longer, I think, a special magic trick to build a solar plant, but to build a solar plant with storage, get it integrated, optimize, and kind of dispatch properly is really the direction we need to go. And that's there's. I'll talk a little bit about the strategies we'll need for what I'm calling Act Two, um, and then Act Three. This is kind of arbitrarily beginning in 2030, but it's really how do we think about the rest of the fossil uh, use in our economy. Um, this is a really big challenge. And I'll talk a little bit about how the challenges and the complexity escalates as we go through time. Uh, but this is really where we're gonna have to move from some of the sort of lower hanging fruit to the really hard to reach uh, abatement activities. I know I'm already <laughs> burning through a lot of time. So let me try and jump through the rest of this uh, pretty quickly to move to Q&A. So a quick status report of where we are with grid decarb. Um, this is a graphic of uh, forecast of where California would be on a hot day in August 2022 from one of our state's planning tools. Uh, 
And I think it shows that we're making a lot of progress with developing clean energy. So that green block is a mix of solar, wind, hydro, demand response, nuclear, it's all of our zero GHG resources. And the, the gray block above it is fossil resources. And you can see the sort of daily pattern. We get a lot of energy demand in the evening. And then this storage, light green, is where we think we'll be roughly in 2022. So storage is becoming, it's becoming visible on the graph, which is, which is critical. Um, but this graphic in five or 10 years is going to look dramatically different. We're going to have so much more storage on the grid, um, even by next summer. And this is really, I think, going to be the decade of storage integration. Um, how do we think about where we are in decarbonizing the grid? Decarbonizing the grid is a sort of notoriously difficult problem to track because we trade a lot of energy across the West. It's really hard to sort of see exactly how much uh, emissions were caused by California versus Oregon, et cetera, et cetera. But one useful proxy is looking at how much um, did we operate the power plants, the gas power plants in the CAISO footprint. CAISO is the balancing authority, the grid operator for most of California. And you can see a pretty secular trend here of emissions declines starting from 2015 through 2020 um, for reasons that uh, I think are, are still to be explored. We had a kind of an emissions bump in 2021, probably had something to do with our hydro resources and demand, but uh, I think there's more analysis to be done to figure out why. But it shows that this is a problem that kind of comes and goes in waves and things like weather and drought can have really significant impacts on, on where we are in the process. Um, I talked a little bit about the storage revolution. This is a soon to be adopted plan by the state's Public Utilities Commission of what we intend to build over the next 10 years. Um, so to put this in context, this, this plan will have us develop over 40,000 megawatts of new clean energy resources in the next 10 years. Um, that's, it's pretty hard to overstate how massive that feat will be in terms of the scale of development as well as the impact of emissions reductions. And you can see in dark purple here, a huge chunk of that is going to be coming from battery storage resources. And I, I personally am very excited about that. Um, and I think this is really the next technical challenge we have as a state is how do we get these batteries to operate and optimize uh, as we need them to, to dispatch during the right times to both reduce emissions and also uh, support reliability. Um, in my last three minutes, uh, let me jump through a couple couple themes um, about where we are and some predictions for the future. So a few predictions as we move forward. So the storage revolution is upon us. You know, really this summer and next summer are going to be the first years where we have really dramatic quantities of storage interconnected to the system. Uh, another really major theme is that we're losing a lot of the conventional sort of existing capacity. So we've lost one of our major nuclear power plants in California, that's the San Onofre uh, Nuclear Generating Station that went offline about 10 years ago. And the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant will be going offline in 2024 and 2025. That is stacked on top of quite a lot of resource retirement elsewhere throughout the West of gas and coal. Um, all of that is, I think, a very beneficial trend from a climate perspective, but it's creating a lot of operational challenges as we think about meeting our capacity and firm energy needs during specific periods. Uh, my prediction is that while we are able and going to make tremendous strides with some of the technologies we have today, solar, wind, and storage, I think we're going to see some really great innovation over the next few years and see some new technologies, really particularly in the uh, clean firm space and also the long duration storage space. Um, I'm optimistic that we're also going to see demand side integration really become meaningful in the next 10 years, particularly as we add more flexible loads like electric vehicles and electric water heaters or heat pump water heaters. And then finally, um, in terms of just sort of making this all shovel ready, there are some very real challenges that we have to address related to how we build transmission, plan, and plan for and build transmission, um, as well as ma maintain the distribution grid. Uh, develop the supply chain and workforce to, to build these projects and resolve sort of how do we get the capital we need to make this happen. And that's that's both on the utility side as well as how we get you know massive amounts of capital towards uh, electrification. Uh, just to, to kind of highlight what I mean when I talk about some of the integration challenges, um, these, these two graphics show the kind of diurnal pattern of solar and wind that's up above is sort of the shape of solar and wind throughout the day relative to load. I believe this is for September, it might be August. 
And then the lower graphic is how we envision energy output from solar and wind throughout the year. So both of these, these are not, you know, relative to currently installed levels of solar and wind, it's sort of normalized, but it gives you a sense of how can we use these puzzle pieces to fit with the shapes that we need to fill, which is the state's demand. Um, and storage is going to play a critical role, particularly in this upper graphic of hitting those morning and evening peaks. Um, I think the seasonal issues that are in the lower graph are actually really hard and are going to need some of those new clean firm and seasonal storage technologies uh, that I hope will be emerging over the next uh, decade or so. Uh, this is a graphic from one of the projects I'm working on related to resource adequacy and reliability planning. So one of the challenges we have with solar and wind is that they can be very variable. Um, so the solar often, particularly in summer months, is, has a very predictable shape. Um, so it's easier to predict, but that shape may not align with our needs. Uh, wind is, is sort of the opposite. Wind can really vary in its output, and it's really hard to say, I'm going to expect a certain quantity of wind to meet my afternoon or evening load. If you look at this graphic, these are, to clarify, these are observations of wind performance in 2018 and 2019. You have some days where there's tons of wind overnight, some days where there's tons of wind in the evening. And so thinking about how to capture the value of this resource and use it for energy storage charging or other reliability purposes is kind of a, a key challenge for us right now. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to jump through a couple couple final slides and then and then pivot here. Um, so one one theme that I've mentioned a little bit is reliability. As we retire existing resources, it's going to be really critical for think for us to think about how do the new resources we develop fit into the, the needs that are being left behind by those retiring resources. Um, I've talked a little bit about technological innovation. I think some of the key areas we'll see expand over the next few years are, are captured on this slide. So heat pump water heaters and heat pumps in general and other electrification technology is really going to help us on demand side integration, as well as some uh, utility scale technologies like enhanced geothermal, solar thermal, hydrogen, possibly even nuclear. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how these play out over the, the coming years. Uh, the second part of innovation that is, is really more the focus of my day to day is policy innovation is thinking about how do we get the right incentives and planning tools and requirements in line so that all of our state's utilities, whether it's pg and &E, a CCA or a competitive uh, electric service provider, how do we get their incentives aligned so that they're bringing and building the right set of resources to keep our grid reliable? Um, I think I'll, I'll just share one slide on this, uh, this, this last section here, which is um, we have some serious considerations in our climate transition. So we've really gone very aggressively on reducing emissions in the electric sector. And that makes sense. We have some of our best technologies in electricity. Solar and wind have dramatically dropped in price and they are essential tools as we make the pivot. But we cannot succeed in the, in the climate uh, transition unless we bring some of that clean energy to other sectors. We really haven't seen reductions in transportation or buildings or industry yet. And now we're really even just starting to see industry talk about net zero pledges decades away, right? And that's, that's really something that's got to change. And so one thing we have to think about is how fast and how hard do we push on the electric sector to go to zero carbon when we need some competitive dynamics to support customers continuing to see electricity as a competitive resource rather than a gas car or a gas stove uh, or a, a gas furnace. Uh, it's doubly so for industry, which is very price sensitive. And I'll, I'll leave off with this graphic, which is thinking about this from sort of an environmental econ terms, is as we go through the climate transition, we really need to be thinking about, you know, starting with the low hanging fruit, kind of highest marginal benefit per marginal cost and moving up the cost curve. And I think it's fair to say that in electricity, we're moving much, much faster up that abatement curve. And frankly, I think spending a lot more money per ton of CO2 reduced and missing a lot of low hanging fruit as a society here on transportation and heating. And I think that's something we really have to confront as we move forward with our next uh, generation of policies. Um, so that was a mouthful. Maybe I'll pause and take a breath and uh, pass it back to Gary and Thomas here. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, serves up a lot of ideas. I've been writing as fast as I could. 
Um, I've been talking as fast as I could, Gary. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> no, I, you know, take as long as you want. And, you know, these things are very flexible. And I can tell that we're going to have you back for another one, Nick. So um, we'll cover whatever we can. But let me start with that last comment. You say you think there's some low hanging fruit that we're missing out there, things where the benefit um, could be a lot more cost effectively achieved. Give us some ideas of, of what you think those are. You sort of mentioned the heat pump, water heaters, uh, electric vehicles. What what else are we missing? Yeah, I, I think Gary, that's that's kind of the right trajectory. But maybe I'll frame it with something that I see. You know, I, I this is my pet peeve, and I walk around all day in SF seeing things that annoy me about inefficient use of fossil fuel. So, for example. You know, electricity, we're working to eliminate the last of our conventional gas plants, even if they run, you know, fairly rarely. That's kind of the end goal we're looking at. And I think that's the right end goal. But I also walk around and I see folks who are effectively driving around, washing cars and using gas powered leaf blowers to dry those cars after they're washed. It is like a mobile detailing service. And I just think this to me is maybe a symbol that we aren't appropriately pricing things like gas or the pollutants that are coming out of that leaf blower, right? Um, and so this is this is kind of an absurd example, right? But I think you're exactly right, is we have these new technologies. We have uh, electric vehicles that have made leaps and bounds and will continue. We have excellent electric heating technologies for both water heating and space heating. And I don't think it's a question so much of do we need new technology, is it's should we be allocating our investment funding and market transformation capital towards some of those activities in lieu of spending more and more and more money on diminishing returns in, ele in electricity. And I don't want to suggest we shouldn't be going down this path of electricity, but we shouldn't be doing it without pursuing the same level of activity in these really stagnant sectors. Well, um, we had another presentation by um, uh, somebody else who was a graduate student at, at UC Davis. Um, on the low carbon fuel standard and um, some of the gains that are being made there. It was, it's really remarkable how fast things are changing there and the idea of, of blending uh, low and even negative carbon fuel supplies into the existing fuel pools and sort of like the same thing being achieved uh, with fuels as was achieved with electricity with you know a certain proportion of the fuel coming from renewable sources uh, and that growing over time. And we had some presentations by some people with some good ideas on, on making more renewable fuels economically. So, you know, I get that portion of what you're talking about, but let me put a different twist on it. From the graphs you showed, this seasonal storage, um, big issue, and even some of the sharp spikes on days when we have unusual conditions of, of heat, um, wind, et cetera. Um, if we gave incentives for renewable fuels in those remaining combustion turbine plants, for example, as, as peakers, do we really want to retire them or is that sort of a, another backstop? If, if we could store a liquid fuel on site and it was a high proportion of, of renewables, um, is that the biggest bang for the buck in fitting that slot on long-term storage in your opinion? I think that's, that's a great question, Gary. And I think that's the exact policy question we need to confront. I think there's a big push towards sort of retirement, demolish, get rid of it all. When in reality, if these are insurance policy resources that run a couple times a year um, and we can decarbonize the fuel over time, we may find that to be you know, really cost effective relative to building a, you know, let's say super long duration storage battery that is also only used once or twice a year, given that, you know, both of them have very low capital utilization, maybe this old gas plant that's largely been financed, maybe a better alternative. I think the flip side of that, though, is it may cost a lot of money for us to kind of retain and maintain some of these gas plants just to be used a couple times a year. You know, you got people who work there and financing and maintenance and permitting. And we may find, I'm optimistic, we'll find technologies over the next decade or so that can help us beat those out economically. 
because really, you know, when you're, when your utilization is as low as it is, you know, 1% capacity factor, emissions aren't really the kind of determining outcome. I think it's really about economics at that point. So that's, that's my hope is that we'll see some, whether it's renewable hydrogen or renewable, renewable natural gas, or potentially some kind of like, you know, we're seeing a lot of excitement around thermal storage and some new battery uh, technologies. This is, this is some of the innovation I'm really excited to see over the next 10 years. But I, I think it's fair to say with the technologies we have today at the current price points, we can make an enormous dent, but these kind of final hard to reach emissions are going to be very difficult to tackle. Right. Well, and the other way of, of looking, matching supply and demand, as you hinted at, is make the demand more flexible. We don't need a storage system if you can shape the demand curve to fit whatever resources are available. Now, in our prior discussions in these sessions, we've talked a lot about the degree of control and monitoring you would need to have in order to achieve that, which is itself going to be a big investment and probably some technologies and some devices that haven't been invented yet. Um, but, you know, similarly, when I walk around and I look at things, um, they just seem to me to be such obvious ways to be able to shape demand. Is it really necessary that all um, soda machines uh, have their refrigeration running 24 uh, seven and there's, there's no timing control over that? Is it really necessary that um, the, the freezers and then the coolers and, and grocery stores can't take a 10 minute interruption? Um, but I don't see the incentives for going forward and installing what's necessary to achieve that control. And I'll wrap in, there's a downside. If you've created something which is under a lot of you know, IT control on a lot of sites, you really have a cybersecurity issue. Uh, if people get into that and, and can mess it up. But what do you see on this idea of essentially taking a software and um, control and management approach to shaping load. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Gary. And I think I think there's, know, let me preface this, there are many smarter folks who have kind of better taxonomies here than me on demand response. This is not kind of my day to day, but particularly I'll point to some of the folks, I think at LBNL who've got this like uh, shake shimmy structure that I found really good, but thinking about this kind of in multiple layers, right? One is you need a momentary reduction. And I think the soda machine example is a great one. You know, the, the smart plug on my fridge through Home Connect. I think there's a lot of efforts there and I'd really like to see that grow. I, I believe the CEC has been working on some standards also so that new appliances will have some of that built in. I haven't followed this very closely, but I think that's a huge area that we'll, we'll pivot into. Um, I think that that's the sort of contingency scenario. And I think what we, we should be thinking about and pivoting to is what are some of the structural shifts, right? So it's not necessarily for that peak day, but for every single day to follow that solar pattern. Um, and it could be pre-cooling for air conditioning and refrigeration. It could be filling the, the belly of the duck with EV charging, or it could be you know restructuring a lot of our you know, industrial activities, water pumping, and I know there's a lot going on in that space, but I think there's there's always more to be done, and particularly on the kind of small small commercial and residential side, this has always been the hardest area to tackle, just from a kind of cost of acquisition standpoint. But I'm I'm optimistic that some of the efforts, like Home Connect, is a great example, are going to really flourish over the next decade here and start building in some of that load shaping. Um, so I'm hopeful. I don't I don't have a ton of direct experience with kind of the status on the ground, other than having smart plugs of my own but uh, I'm, I'm excited about that so what's your experience with the smart plugs do they interfere with what you're doing or do you basically forget that you even have them yeah and i guess i didn't answer your question about cybersecurity. i mean i think the cybersecurity risk is is definitely real and particularly with consumer devices you know there's a wide range of um how should i put this you know i've i've gotten you know kind of uh, reviewed, endorsed smart plugs through CEC programs where I have total trust. I've also bought a smart power strip on Amazon that has no, you know, company behind it whatsoever. And I have, you know, very little ability to trust that they're taking cybersecurity seriously. But the biggest issue I've had when I was a grad student at Davis, I was an OpenConnect customer in a house with a few other grad students and uh, plugged into our fridge. 
And I told all my housemates about it. He made a few months go by and sometimes they open up the fridge and the lights off and they're confused. And, you know, one day I come home and I realize the smart plug has been unplugged for weeks and, you know, I just didn't even know. So I think this, this kind of human error factor and for us energy nerds in the household who care, convincing the rest of the household to care, that's probably something many folks on this call have experienced in some way or another, right? But uh, I think that's that's part of the challenge is that the human acceptance level, most people just have not really seen a reason to care about either the quantity or shape of their energy demand. Uh, and I don't know that that's gonna change in our lifetime. So making it seamless for the consumer you know, if my smart plug turned off the, the refrigeration portion of the unit and left the light on, that probably wouldn't have happened. It was still yeah. very cold. Yeah, right. No. I mean, uh, the, that could be as simple as putting a battery on the, the light and making sure it's a DC light. Um, I, exactly. I kind of want to um, highlight um, that I feel like that's a, the human portion of it is a, is something I think we've heard from every single kind of wonky person in the energy space that, if it weren't for humans, this would be easy, but it's also um, one of the reasons to be hugely optimistic because um, outside of kind of the energy industry, there's a whole lot more, I guess I'd say marketing gurus than there are inside the energy industry and a whole lot of people who have successfully changed consumer dynamics. So I, I'd, I'd like to hope to all the entrepreneurs out there that, you know, are thinking of that, you know, kind of B to C um, solutions that saying that there's problems with people that's your area. That's your area. If you're that type of entrepreneur, is solving the human, uh, the human behavior one. But um, Nick, I've had experience with a lot of aggregators that have tried to put together, um, you know, fifty thousand customers that are willing to have water heaters controlled or thermostats or something like that. But boy, the story that goes along with that is over time, uh, consumers just have strong tendency to unplug all that stuff like your roommates did. Where are we in um, making this, you know, something that isn't so defeatable by consumers or um, is there just such a downside on human behavior that um, we're not going to be able to aggregate these things and control them in the way that we would like to? And what's your view, Nick? Yeah, it's a really great question, Gary. And I do, Peter, want to come back to the question about batteries as capacity. But um, I think, you know, this is very consistent with sort of the narrative that I hear around um, kind of non, what's the right term, kind of behavioral efficiency programs in general. Uh, I'll, I'll preface this by saying this is not my area of expertise, but I, I see, maybe I can speak to an, an issue that I do work more on in some of the parallels is I think a lot of this is about how we structure the incentives and the hooks, both for the aggregators and the customers. Um, so a great example of this is what's happening right now with uh, rooftop solar and batteries is um, there's a narrative, which I think is true, that rooftop solar and batteries can provide a huge benefit to reliability, but that's, that's premised on we dispatch these batteries, we charge and dispatch these batteries at the right time to mitigate demand you know, in, in the periods we need it. And Something that's happened with the uh, wildfire based outages, the PSPS events, is that the companies who are selling solar plus storage will sell the customer on having a sort of storm mode. So on the hottest day of the year or the day when we most need that dispatchable response, the battery shuts off, holds all the energy, sort of retains it for the event of an outage. And so we're, we're still having all of that peak demand draw on the grid that we're sort of assuming all of our modeling is one of the benefits we're getting by installing the solar and storage. But actually the, the real life performance is that that storage is retained for the customer and not kind of used for that reliability benefit. So that's that's one that's really one of my pet peeves currently. Uh, but I think as part of this is like, that only exists because we haven't structured the incentives and policies properly uh, to ensure that that resource is behaving in the way consistent with the sort of like societal policy goals that we're looking for. And so whenever we think about these trade-offs, maybe it's great that we have home batteries with storm mode and they don't contribute to the grid, but we shouldn't be paying them as though they're reliability resources in that event. And that's that's really, I think, missed in a lot of these discussions. Um, so that's a, it's obviously a very different example, I think, Gary, than what you brought up, but the same, the heart of it is the same, is how do we structure the contract that that aggregator has to bring to the customer before it can get that funding from the utility. And it's really hard to, to get a customer to say, 
I'm going to have a plug on my fridge for the next 20 years, you know, uh, and commit to that is a really difficult, really difficult thing. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. Um, and then maybe there's some, some other ways around that, but let me just, I mean, we are getting towards the end of the session here and there've been a lot of good comments on there and, and Mark Roost in particular has been contributing quite a few questions on there you may want to take a look at but to come back to your thing on the increase in storage in the near term i was reading your graph as fast as i could um so I'll i saw 15, back up. yeah fifteen thousand megawatts of storage in 2032 and we're now about three thousand megawatts what are, what is 2022 looking like for how much storage we would have by the august time frame time frame Gary, this is an excellent question it's a number i should have offhand but i don't i know i think we just past the 1000 megawatts mark on Kaiso installs. There are more, more batteries at homes, although I think 1000 megawatts is, is probably in the ballpark, but I think we're gonna have quite a few new projects uh, completing their interconnection before the summer of 2022. And that trend is really going to escalate over the next few years. Um, so one theme that I, I should have touched on, but I don't think I, I hit, and it's kind of central to a lot of the work I do is you know, this is the state plan. I'm not sure if my screen share has worked here, but hopefully it has. This is the state plan. And what we really lack today and what we're trying to build is how do we convert this plan into something actionable? And there's really no policy structure today that says this plan must result in what, you know, PG&E and Valley Clean Energy and all the other utilities will bring back. There are some requirements around what they have to build. But we're currently kind of debating what policy structures need to be developed so that we actually get this, this right. outcome and do some of the orchestration. Because what we've seen, I think, in the past is if everybody just goes and buys what's sort of economically the best, we're probably not going to get this optimal mix. We might not get things like geothermal or long duration storage that are kind of necessary to facilitate the level of solar and wind development that we're going to have. Yeah, I mean, that, that is, that's really a steep curve there. In terms of what you're expecting to see, and, uh, enormous, like unprecedented, I think, scale yeah. of build. And we, I kind of covered this in in like half a second, but we really need to think about what are the structures, whether it's workforce, supply chain, minerals, all of the above, to make this happen um, here and across the world. It's a it's a big it's a very very big adventure we're all on. Um, um, Nick, um, any observations on the? NEM, uh, I guess, net energy metering debate from yesterday. Thanks, Thomas. So maybe we'll just extend this into another hour for that. Well, well I'll just like <laughs> cap it no, off and then uh, I'll wrap it up. Uh, an excellent, an excellent policy discussion. One of my, uh, it's a love hate policy issue I've, I've worked on for a long time. And I would commend everyone who's interested in this to, to take a look at the, um, the debate, I think the recording is coming out later this week between uh, Professor Severin Bornstein from Haas and Dr. Ahmad Farouki, who's a recently retired energy economist. Um, you know, in broad strokes, I think it's a really interesting place that we're at, which is, you know, we've built an incredible industry here in California to install rooftop solar. Um, a lot of that has been built on uh, what's called net energy metering, which is a, a very generous uh, structure for how we pay customers who have rooftop solar. Um, so just to give some context in pg e territory where I live, uh, if I didn't live in an apartment and had rooftop solar, I could get paid about um, $300 per megawatt hour for my rooftop solar. Uh, if, if I were a utility scale solar developer, I would be very happy in a competitive bid to be making $30 to $35 a megawatt hour. That's about what it costs to get solar. And what has happened over the last decade is that Many folks across the state, particularly folks who are homeowners and have good credit and generally have access to capital, have built rooftop solar on their houses and are getting this tremendous payout. Um, and the way that our utility regulation structure works is all of the costs that are not being paid by those customers are now falling on essentially the rest of us. Uh, and so I, I don't... Um, I, I'm, I'm an all-electric apartment dweller suffering under quite a lot of uh, rate pressure to now subsidize folks in suburbs who now are essentially getting eight to 10 times the market rate for solar. So as you can imagine, this has created quite an uproar among uh, political folks as well as policy folks. And the Public Utilities Commission has just put out a decision in the last month or so that would, would start to, to peel back on those subsidies. 
it's a pretty aggressive peelback, frankly, probably more aggressive than I had expected would come out. Um, and you're seeing the sort of rhetorical lineup between uh, rooftop solar industry folks who say, oh my God, the sun is falling, we're gonna tax solar, we're giving up on our climate goals. And uh, I would maybe put myself in the other camp, which is to say, rooftop solar can be a great tool in the toolbox for our climate trajectory, but it has to be priced competitively. And we can't live in a world where all of the wealthy people in California have rooftop solar and are not contributing to the cost of the grid, the cost of utility scale renewables, the cost of low income programs and efficiency, and all of the costs for those things fall on those of us who are uh, don't own our homes, don't have good credit, or don't have access to capital. Um, so it's a it's kind of fundamentally a really sticky policy problem at the intersection of sort of regressive fiscal policy meets complicated uh, environmental and utility policy. So. Uh, well, I don't, that was a bit of a mouthful. Maybe that just that, created more confusion than not. Well, but well what, what you've done, Nick, is you've, watch the video. You, you've now defined the topic for the next time we invite you back. Um, and, and we'll spend that that hour on it. But the um, people on the call here, they're always looking for opportunities. And, but they also need to pay attention to what's actually happening in the marketplace. So they're aware of these shifts on on how people may be paid for rooftop solar as they define their business. Very important topic, but thank you very much for taking the time this morning, Nick. It was very illuminating and um, I think everybody appreciates it. So round of applause, applause Nick. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both so much for having me and thanks to, to everybody for coming on. This is really fun to 